Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Andrew Sharman, President of IOSH. Thank you for welcoming the presidential team today to this joint event across the South region. I'm delighted that we are bringing branches together in this way and today I'd like to welcome all members from London Met, South Coast, South Downs, South East, South West and Thames Valley. Great to have you here. I just wanted to address you all as your president with a note of support as we try to cope as well as we can through this unprecedented challenge as the pandemic continues. COVID-19, the coronavirus has and still of course is continuing to disrupt our lives and we're having to isolate ourselves, distance ourselves from family and friends and work in different ways and not being able to engage or interact in the ways that we're used to. And it's quite unsettling, isn't it? I also found myself in exactly that situation. A quick four day trip to visit family back home in Scotland turned into three months with a weekend back. I was locked down in Scotland away from my usual home in Switzerland where I normally live. And I was fed up out of living out of a suitcase in an Airbnb rental apartment and not being able to go and see my family or get back to work. During those three months, I also managed to contract the coronavirus and had several weeks of not feeling particularly well. Uh, and still have some unpleasant symptoms lurking around, which the doctors tell me is pretty normal and will still be around for a little while yet. So three months away from my normal home, as my work was changing and our lives changing too, no matter who we are, where we are or what we do, coronavirus has brought significant change. And I don't know about you, but I've kind of had enough of this pandemic already. But I guess all we can do is to be patient, which for those of you who know me is something that doesn't really come that easy to me. Despite all said though, we must take away the positives, uh, embracing the time that we've had to spend with those that we love, finding ways to strengthen connections with other people through webinars like this or video chats, phone calls, letters, social media, and instant chat messaging. Over the last few months, I've found myself writing handwritten notes to people, little note cards or postcards or letters, something I haven't done since I was a kid. And I'm doing that because I realize I've probably lost a bit of touch with these people, but they're still important to me in my life. So I just wanted to reach out and say hello. And it's quite a special feeling getting a letter or a card back through the mail from people, something that perhaps we take for granted in the world of email and instant chat. Of course, there's the common feeds on the pandemic, isn't there? They're hard to avoid, aren't they? Coronavirus dominates every newspaper, news feed and news report. But we need to find a balance. We can get too much news. And I think that one of the biggest risks from this pandemic is the infodemic that accompanies it. So I've been trying hard not to watch any news over the last few months and instead take my updates from the scientific institutions once or twice per week. I guess we're all finding our own ways to cope and to understand what the pandemic means for us and what our role is, whether it's as a husband, partner, wife, brother, sister, father, mother, friend, colleague, co-worker or, or other. And I guess if this pandemic period has taught me anything, it's taught me the importance of human connection. Governments around the world are telling us that we need to apply social distance between people. But I think that's a misnomer. What governments want us to do is to have physical distance between us, a specified distance to keep between individuals and small groups. It's not social distance, it's physical distance, because I think social distance is actually reducing over the period of the pandemic. As we find these ways to interact and connect with people, we've become more social than perhaps ever before. One thing that's really important to me as your president is the work that you do. It's never been more important than now that the profession has an opportunity to come right to the fore in this pandemic. At the end of March, I recorded a short message on video for you as IOSH members. And I did another at the beginning of June. In fact, I've just filmed another one this afternoon too. That'll go live in a few days. They've been dubbed as my co-videos where I spoke about all the amazing efforts of OSH professionals around the world, including nearly 48,000 of us IOSH members in 130 countries now. Many of our members are either working from home with families and kids around or from makeshift desks on our dining tables, in our sheds or in our spare rooms. And then there are those of us who are in different, displaced 
or unusual work environments. Regardless of where we are, we're all joining forces as one to ensure that we and our membership remain strong. And it's a real pride and honour for me to be your president, particularly in these turbulent times during the pandemic. If you haven't already seen those videos, you can watch a copy of them on the IOSH coronavirus resources page, iosh.com forward slash coronavirus. But feel free to share them in your own networks too. In a couple of those videos, I also spoke about the IOSH Benevolent Fund. Many of our members may be facing hardships during this challenging time, and that's where the Benevolent Fund could really offer a lifeline of financial or other support to members who are struggling. And I encourage you to take advantage of this if you find yourself in that situation, or if you know someone that might be able to use just a little bit of extra help right now. To find out more, just visit iosh.com forward slash Benevolent Fund. To show our support, every member of the IOSH presidential team has donated to this vital fund, and we'd really appreciate all other contributions, no matter how small. Every pound can help one of our members. So if you're able to do so, please consider boosting this fund. No matter how much you have to give, it will help your fellow colleagues and members. Donation is really quick and simple. You can do it in just two or three minutes by credit or debit card at iosh.com forward slash how to donate. It goes without saying that we'll all be feeling somewhat anxious by the changes that we're experiencing over the last few months and into the future. So to address this, I'll soon be handing over to Tim Eldridge, one of our vice presidents, to Kate Field and Jesse Gomez, council members, who will present a session on how our mental and physical well-being can be affected in these difficult times and how to mitigate those effects. You see, our members are critical to a safe and healthy recovery from times of crisis and occupational risk like this. So it's important our membership is supported and the presidential team are really proud of the efforts dedicated to doing this. So far we've taken this presentation to over 2,000 members in our network and our poll results have shown us that over 65% of our members say they've felt an element of stress due to the current situation, which evidences that we really need to talk about our physical and mental well-being. So I hope each of you take something useful away from today's presentation. During these difficult times, it's important to remember that the little things we do often make the biggest difference. Looking out for one another, our loved ones, our friends, our neighbours, recognising and thanking those that are working throughout this period, whether it's the key workers, those on the front line, or your colleagues at work. A phone call, a letter, a video, a postcard perhaps, whatever we can do to stay connected. So thanks for joining us on this webinar today. We're all on this journey together as one IOSH I believe that we will succeed this virus. I'm sharing my personal journey each week in my LinkedIn posts, which I'm calling the life of the Irish president. And I encourage you to get involved in the discussions there. I'll post a link to them in the chat box when I finish talking. We're getting thousands of people each week sharing their perspectives and comments. There's loads of great learning going on. So I hope you come and join us there too. Of course, Irish will continue to keep you updated and support you through this challenging period. Keep an eye on the Irish website, in particular, the COVID page, where there's a number of resources updated on an almost daily basis. As I said at the beginning, right now is the moment that the profession can really shine. Our profession has never been more needed and never been more important, in my view. I think now's the time that we'll look back at in years to come and say, that's when things really changed. That's when we were recognized. That's when we were valued. I can't wait for that moment. But until then, thank you for your time today. I wish you and your loved ones the very best. Take care of yourselves and each other. And don't forget to make some time for yourself and your own well-being too. Stay safe. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, really great to hear from you. Um, and really great to have, I think, now almost 300 uh, people on this webinar, so uh, kudos to the South, Re the South regions uh, for, for, for bringing so many of our, our members and, and hopefully non-members together. And I'm pretty certain as well that we've got members from not just the South region and normally on these, these webinars we have members from all over the world. So, so welcome to everyone. Now, um, I'm sure many of you, you may have questions for Andrew, so please if you do, go to the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, type them in and, and we'll, uh, we can ask some questions of Andrew. Um, 
while I'm waiting for you to do that, I've got one for you, Andrew. Uh, my question is, is it too late to vote in the council elections? Good question, Tim. Uh, it, it's almost too late, but right now it's not. You've still got a couple of hours. Um, there's four hours, more or less. The voting closes at five o'clock British summer time tonight. So in about four hours time. So if you haven't yet voted, uh, now's a great time to do it. I know it's challenging this year, isn't it? We've had more applications than ever before for council. But remember, council is the voice of the membership. Councillors exist to make sure that we at the centre of IOSH are acting in the best interests of our members. So even if you don't know anybody on the list of councillors that, that are standing for election this time around, just take a few minutes this afternoon to go look through and see if there's a couple that resonate with your personal values, the way you see IOSH, the sorts of changes and opportunities that you predict for us in the future. Uh, and cast your vote today before five o'clock British summertime in the UK. Excellent, thank you. So we're still waiting for some questions to come through. I know Nigel's, Nigel very much agrees with you on the point that there's a time for us as professionals to, to make a difference. And I think we've all, all recognised that if we don't seize the opportunity when we're in the, in the spotlight, then we never will. So I, I, I see many, many great examples of of members around the world you know really stepping up at this time i know you do too so we we take our hats off to them all don't we indeed we do yeah do we have so, any more it, it's uh it, it, it's interesting isn't it tim that this is one of the biggest participations that we've had on these webinars for for quite some time nearly 300 people as you say and uh and questions are slow so just to be clear uh, I, I'm open to take questions on any subject that, uh, that anyone in the audience wishes. We don't have to talk about COVID. I know there's plenty of that chat going on. So if there's anything on your mind and, and, and you want to ask me or just share some feedback, I'm very welcome to hear from you. You can see a couple of questions coming in now, Tim, so that's great. Uh, let's see if we can tackle a couple of those. Yeah, should we start with Ian's one? Um, it's a bit specific, but it, it's, it's worth talking about because training and, uh, and assessment and, and, and within the COVID environment. So. Ian was wondering, will, will I be actually offering a course uh, to act as a COVID-19 assessor or demonstrate competence? If not, do you know what else I is doing around supporting members? Um, I, I'm not aware, Ian, of whether IOSH is creating a COVID-19 assessment course. Uh, that's something that would fall part of operations and, and, and the team there. But certainly there is a, a, a lot of activity going on that you can see on the coronavirus resources page on IOSH.com. You can get downloads of, of previous recordings like uh, webinars like this one today, as well as the slide decks that are being used in our weekly webinar sessions too, that we've been running with people like the World Health Organization, the ILO, the UN, and, and many more. So stacks of resources there, and that's where I direct as many people as possible to, to go and get the very latest on what's going on. Great, thanks. I'm going to combine two here and be, be a bit cheeky, but we've got one from Jan and one from Michael, which are kind of similar. It's around what IOSH is doing and working at this time with, with the UK government and, pretend, and probably the regulator, the HSE. So are we, are we as an organisation engaging with those, um, those parts of the, uh, the establishment? Yeah, look, um, IOSH and the HSC have got a great relationship. They're one of our strategic partners and, and have been for a very long time. Um, we've been working closely with them on COVID and many other topics too, of course. We, we actively engage and involve the HSE and work in partnership with them. So, uh, so, so plenty of stuff going on with them. Uh, Jan's interestingly pointed to uh, what I think of the HSE's performance. Jan, I'm not sure I'm, I'm best placed to comment on that, to be honest. I haven't lived in the UK for 10 years now. I live in Switzerland. Uh, so I'm not sure what the HSE are up to on a day-to-day -day basis around covid uh, although I know that, uh, like many organisations, the HSE feel a bit stretched right now and have done for the last few years, haven't they? So uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give a more direct answer on that. I've got a great one here for you, Andrew, from Delwyn. So, Andrew, how do you stay fresh and interested when you speak and listen to so many people every day? It's a skill, but any hints and tips? Oh, Delwyn, yeah. Um, I, I think there's a compliment in there. If you're thinking I'm looking fresh and interested, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I just had a little cup of espresso directly before this session. Uh, I, I'm kind of thriving on the energy of these things at the moment, Delwyn. Uh, I, I'm bouncing from one Zoom call to the next to the next. I've got another one in just 13 minutes time. Um, I, 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 I think the two things that are at the heart of it is that I, I'm truly loving being the president 
of the world's greatest institution for health and safety at work. It's, it's an amazing honor and a privilege. I've been in safety for 25 years. I've volunteered for Ausch for 24 out of those 25 years. Uh, and this feels like the real pinnacle for me. I've had lots of roles as branch secretary, branch chair, vice chairman of the board, vice president, uh, and, and now president. And, and um, I guess the thing that keeps me most interested, the, the spice here perhaps, is stuff like this and questions like that and the opportunity to hear what's going on out there in the membership. And um, in fact, I've, I've visited 41 out of 44 branches now. Uh, and so there's three branches left that I've got to get to see before I end my, uh, my term as president at the end of October. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I might be the first president to get to every one of the branches, which would be a great thing. I'd, uh, I'm setting that as a bit of a target for myself right now. You've put it out there, Andrew, so everyone will want to know at the end whether you've achieved it. So we, we look forward to that. <laughs> I, know, I know you will. Um, I, another one, I've just picked one here from David, which I think is a really important one. So um, as, as you've said yourself, Andrew, it's been quite a year for you to be <laughs> IOS president and you've had COVID. And of course, we've had the, the Black Lives Matter movement, which has affected all of us across the globe. Mm. And what David says, it's great to see so many people from different backgrounds up for IOS council election. What else can we do as an organization to promote equity and opportunity for all in the profession? Yeah, hey Dave, what a great question. Thanks for that. Uh, you're right, I've had quite a year uh, as, as an IOS president. It's certainly not the year that I anticipated. I thought it might have been much more different than this. Um, I, uh, I suppose I can offer a personal perspective here and then I'll try and offer a broader perspective. I, I, I believe black lives matter. I believe white lives matter. I believe every color and denomination and creed of lives matter. I believe that we're all here on this earth as, as equals. Uh, and then I think the, the, the bigger answer here is what can we do? Well, we can all remember that leadership is everything we do and everything we don't do. It's also everything we say and everything we don't say. Uh, and right now, as the OSH profession is in the spotlight, it's up to us to role model the right behaviors through our leadership, remembering that it's everything we do and everything we don't. So by act and omission, this sounds almost like 1974 legislation speak, doesn't it? But our acts and our omissions count towards who we are as leaders. So it's about thinking about what example you want to set, particularly because this spotlight is on us as OSH practitioners, as organizations, communities, and societies look to us for guidance and direction and perspective on this terrible pandemic. Thanks, Andrew. Now, we, as expected, we've now started to get a, a whole raft of questions through, but I really want to give the opportunity for our, our main presenters to do the, the webinar. However, we will have time at the end as well for Q&A, so I know some of those questions we can absolutely pick up at the end as well, so we will do that. So, so thank you again, Andrew, for, yeah, for, for being here and being um, able to join on a, on a very hot day here in the UK, if you weren't aware that everyone is uh, enjoying pr uh, plus 30 degrees, I think, down south. Yeah, um, same here in Switzerland. We're at 36 degrees here today, and we had a 42 degree day last week here. It's um, for a pale skinned Scotsman, it's definitely a challenging time. So as someone has written actually in the chat box, stay hydrated. Remember, we need a little bit more water than usual right now. So um, Thank you very much for, for having me, Tim. Thanks for facilitating some questions. If there's something specific uh, that you wanted to ask me and you didn't get the chance to ask me, feel free to connect with me. I've posted my LinkedIn uh, connection in the chat box. Uh, if there's a question you've got for me as your president, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and I'll respond to you separately. Or get involved in these, uh, these weekly discussion points, the life of the Irish president. There'll be another one posted in my LinkedIn profile this afternoon. I'd love you to share your thoughts on that too. But for now, stay well. Be well, go safe, and uh, look forward to seeing you and hearing you wherever you are over the next few weeks again. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye, Tim. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and goodbye. So let, moving on now to the, the main topic of this webinar. Um, we've been, as a presidential team, we developed this uh, topic some while ago, really just to, as a, an opportunity to engage with members around a topic that I think we're all really interested in. And um, as Andrew said, we've been uh, able to present um, this uh, session at many, many, many branches, not just here in the UK, but globally. But now it's even better now. We've got the opportunity to get some of our council members and they've been really keen to be able to present as well. So I'm actually delighted that 
um, you're not going to be hearing from me today, and I'm sure you are too. But we're actually we've got two of our our new new uh, council members, um, Kate and Jesse, who are going to take you through the webinar today. So I'm delighted that they've both agreed to join to join us and present today. So, without further ado, Kate, I will hand over to you and take it away, please. Lovely. Thank you, uh, Tim. And uh, it was great to have uh, an introduction from Andrew. And um, hello, everyone who's here uh, today. We've had a really great turnout. Um, so I let's see whether my yeah, here we go. This is it. I don't usually nor I don't usually uh, use Zoom. So it's slightly different. There we go. Let's see which button works. Um, so I'm going to start our uh, session before handing over to Jesse. And I'm on a very strict time frame. So I'm going to start my uh, timer now to make sure that I don't go over. Um, so in terms of uh, today's session, so this presentation is being put together you know, by our presidential team, very much aimed to help and support you during the, the challenges that COVID-19 is, is presenting. Um, but also, you know, the, there's, there's information here that can support your wider community in terms of and your family. And I think sometimes, you know, we, we forget that we have the opportunity to, to support our loved ones with our, with our knowledge, as well as what we do on a professional basis. So I would encourage you uh, to do that. It's going to contain sort of some some basic information in, in terms of psychological health, you know, the the effects, what to look for and then when to seek seek help. And I know, you know, an awful lot of you will be very familiar with this. But I think one of the things that we sometimes forget as health and safety professionals is to take a moment for ourselves. And this is very much what this session is designed about. It's just a, a time for some reflection to think about, you know, how we are doing and how we are supporting ourselves. So in terms of what we're going to cover is we're just going to kind of refresh in terms of the, the sort of stages in terms of uh, prevention, you know, the, the impact of COVID um, and the, the, the potential negative psychological um, impacts that that can have. So that's very much kind of what we're, we're going to cover and, and then obviously signpost you to, to more health and support where um, necessary. So to get us started then, um, we're actually going to kick off with a poll. Um, so we'd really like your involvement in this. Um, there are going to be two polls in, in the session, um, but the first one is this one. So do you feel anxiety or stress due to the current situation? So I'm going to give you um, a few seconds to just take part in the poll. And, and as you heard, where we've run these sessions before, you know, we ha we've asked this question before um, and it's really uh, it's really helpful to IOSH to understand how you are doing because it helps us gauge what additional help and support that you actually need. So, you know, do, do please take part, you know, let us give us a feeling about the, the anxiety and, and the stress um, that you're going through. So um, I know Ben's operating in the background and he's, uh, he's looking at uh, how many people have voted. Um, so I'm going to leave it in his hands. Once we've got a kind of um, enough of you who have participated. Um, and I know certainly from, from my point of view, you know, there's, 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 definitely a roller coaster that I've been on um, in terms of feeling anxiety and stress and you know I think that's something for us to reflect on and you know we'll, we'll touch on in this presentation that it you know it is something that uh, you know we are going to be facing as we go through so um, here we go in terms of the, the results so 61% of you um, are feeling um, either anxiety or stress at the moment. So that's consistent with the kind of the other um, uh, polls that we've held so far in terms of the presentation. So thank you very much for, for participating. You know, I think it's completely normal and natural to um, be feeling anxiety and stress at the moment. As I say, um, it's, you know, there's an awful lot going on and we, we don't know quite when uh, the end of it's going to, to, going to come. So moving on into the actual presentation itself, we're going to just kind of spend a few moments reflecting on the sort of the, the controls that we can put in place around um, psychological health, mental health. And it's it, we are familiar with the hierarchy of controls, you know, elimination, engineering controls, etc. Um, but when we look at health, we frame it slightly differently. We talk about primary, secondary um, and tertiary support. So primary um, interventions are aimed at those who are healthy and keeping them healthy in really simple terms. 
And then our secondary um, controls are when people start to show early indications of a problem um, and we, we start to take actions, implement controls to actually mitigate those, those early symptoms. Um, and then the final stage is tertiary. So that's when people are actually unwell um, and we look to give them uh, you know, the, the help and support in terms of their, their recovery. Um, but one of the things I think it's it's so when I'm, I'm going to step back a little bit here. So when I think about this, you know, and I, I think about with my my OSH head on, I kind of think of primary as being elimination in our normal hierarchy of controls. It's about preventing it from happening in the first place. And then our secondary um, controls are, are kind of the, the other elements of the hierarchy control, the engineering, um, the training, the administration that go in there. You know, they they they're not necessarily preventing it, but they're helping manage it. You know, there, there's some mitigation in there. And then tertiary is sort of underneath the, our, uh, our, our, our hierarchy of controls in terms of intervention. Um, so that, I mean, I thought I'd share that because I find that quite a helpful way of, of approaching it. Um, and I think, you know, the, the key thing to understand here is that, you know, understanding our journey through these phases but understanding what we're aiming to do is is staying as it's if you're not colorblind as it is on on the screen here the kind of the first triangle the green triangle you know we want to maintain our health and, and keep ourselves as healthy as possible um and but also recognize you know when that starts to change and when we need to to get help and one of the things i've made an, a note here to to mention and it will come up a little bit later but i wanted to, to do a shout out if you are getting to the point in secondary but certainly also in, in the tertiary stage are starting to feel unwell. If you have access to um, employment assistance programs and, and many of our organizations do supply those um, do make use of them. Um, it's one of the things in one of my previous roles I, I uh, implemented within um, my organization and I can't begin to tell you the difference it made for the people who actually accessed it. Um, it made such a huge difference to their health and their well-being to know that there was support and particularly where you know there's counselling available people are often really nervous about accessing EAPs you know they think that maybe you know what they say uh, to the the counsellor if, if that's what the support they're accessing will somehow get back to their work that doesn't happen there are very very strict governance controls exactly the same as it would be if you went to your GP um, you know the governance controls are, are very good and the support is amazing so you know if it's something that you know your organization has but you've never really looked at it I would encourage you to go and look at it and do access it because it really can make a, a huge difference so that's that was kind of my shout out on that but we will cover it but I've, I've used EAP programs before now um, in in times when I I've had personal issues going on or I'm struggling and it you know actually being able to talk to somebody completely ind independent you know makes it makes a huge difference so I think one of the things kind of reflecting on how we quite often approach um, mental ill health um, and psychological health in in the workplace is we often approach it back to front <laughs> um, the strategies that we often put in place um, in in uh, organizations is uh, at, the, at the end at the site at the stage when people are starting to become unwell and struggling um, rather than focusing on what we can do in advance and I think that's that's one of the things when we're thinking about it and you know this is what this is about your your health is what can you do now to keep yourself fit and healthy um, what are the preventative elements that you can do now for me personally one of the things that I've focused on is I know that I need a break away from work I know that actually I need a, a full two week break away because I need that time to completely unwind before I come sort of back to work um, and it's been hugely busy you know I'm sure like all of you you know as health and safety professionals Andrew mentioned it you know we are at the forefront of what's going on um, but I recognized actually it's really important that I took that break because you know I was starting to feel the excess pressure 
um, and I recognised that, you know, from my own health and well-being that I needed to take that break. And that can be difficult, you know, when you're there's an expectation on you to be helping and supporting maybe where you're working. But it is really important that you look after yourself. And for me, that's that's very much how we um, how I approached it was making sure that I had the break. And I don't know how well you can see, but I got good weather while I was camping in Wales. So I've got a nice suntan as well. So I, I look healthy, which will also help sometimes. So in terms of kind of this um, session, as I'm sure um, you are aware, you know, IOSH has identified um, six priorities in terms of um, occupational health and safety. And of course, um, well-being, um, physical uh, and mental health is one of those priorities. Um, and I think, you know, the the current situation really brings home um, why that needs to be a priority, both both for ourselves and, and the organisations um, in terms of, of where we are. And, you know, again, a lot, I'm sure many of you will be aware that there are a number of different elements um, that can lead to stress, determine stress. Sometimes we might call them stress factors or um, uh, actually just hazards. Um, and that there are various, various models, um, but we know and all of those models tend to identify that there are some key things that are much more likely to heighten our feeling of stress and create this excess pressure where it starts to become problematic for us. Um, and we've got control. Um, so how much control we feel that we have of a current situation. And if we think about COVID, that's we have no control. You know, there is... We have no control over, over the virus. The, um, the lockdown measures are coming uh, from on high from governments um, or, you know, and, and based on, on World Health Organization guidance. We have no control out over that. We, you know, we've been told that we can't see our family. Um, no control. Then we have demands, um, you know, so so actually kind of, you know, the demands being placed on us. And I think is, you know, very much as as health and safety professionals, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I I have I have quite a busy role anyway. Um, but particularly the, the first sort of um, the first three months um, were just insane, actually, for me. Um, and on top of that, you know, we might have um, homeschooling to be dealing with the kind of, you know, supporting maybe de other dependents, our, our, our family, but from afar, we can't help and support those. I know that I face that. My mum my lives separately. She needs some help and support with her own mental health. So, you know, there's kind of additional demands. And then on top of that, um, one of the ways that we kind of manage those demands is by having a, a social network, um, social support. And of course, again, you know, that's been removed from us. Um, so it's a really challenging time. And I think the, the other thing to, to bear in mind is one of the other common um, sort of stress factors or elements that um, create stress is, is change or uncertainty. Um, and we are in a situation where we are facing, you know, a huge amount of uncertainty. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know what the end will look like um, and what the future will be. Um, and also within our organisations, you know, there is change going on, you know, the, the classic and easiest example is you know so many of us have been working from home where maybe we haven't before and a lot of our organizations are saying well actually this seems to work for quite a lot of us and for quite a lot of the businesses so maybe we can we can make some of this aspects of this permanent that's big change and I know that you know some organizations are, are looking at bigger change as well um, and then of course on top of that you know we've, we've got the kind of economic impact that this has had and the uncertainty that that creates you know there, there's some of you who maybe have been furloughed yourselves or working in organizations that have um, people who have been furloughed you know we're starting to see an increase in in redundancies you know <laughs> I liked Andrew's point about you know not watching the news I agree totally with that. I'm absolutely on board. You know, it became very clear to me, you know, six weeks in that it was just, you know, there was nothing new and it was just, it was just aggravating my anxiety about what was going on. But, you know, I do touch base sort of um, once a week to see what's going on. And, you know, the, 
obviously a lot of conversations about the economic impact. Um, and we know from the, the previous financial crisis that um, that sort of economic crisis can have, you know, really significant impacts on people's mental health. So, you know, we've got a huge amount going on um, and to consider and, and think about. And of course, as, you know, health and safety risk risk professionals um, and I said we don't always think of, think of about ourselves as that as being risk professionals but that that's what we are you know we are very familiar with you know understanding where um, you know risk and, and how it uh, how to map it in terms of thinking about whether it's high risk low risk likelihood all, all of the, the standard things we're familiar with and I think, you know, the thing to understand in terms of the situation where we are now is that, you know, it is going to be frequent and almost certain um, that we're going to have impacts on our mental health. In actual fact, I was on a, um, a webinar yesterday um, for risk, a risk organisation, um, and they were saying that, you know, now, you know, in the UK, we tend to use the statistics, you know, one in four people have experienced depression or anxiety. Um, but they're saying, actually, you know, for the first time ever, we're probably in a situation where, you know, we can say 100% of people are experiencing it. So that likelihood element is, you know, is is right up there. Um, and of course, in terms of the, the, the severity, then, you know, depending on where we catch it, that will flux. Um, but the reality is, you know, the anxiety, and depression can be very very serious so it absolutely starts to move us up into um the you know the high risk category um you know and and where we need to take very proactive steps to to manage ourselves so that gives me um the perfect moment to um hand on to jesse for the second half of the presentation thank you kate <laughs> sorry thank you very much uh, so now we're going to talk about um, more about the vicious spiral, which was uh, introduced in 2001 by uh, ILO with their initiative program called SOLVE, S-O-L-V-E. And um, this SOLVE program look at um, what are the different um, negative incomes and stress can have in people's uh, life. So uh, some of them, uh, and I think uh, most of us have seen a, a surge of uh, domestic violence uh, since uh, the uh, COVID-19. But also we probably also experience like inadequ inadequate sleeping due to the level of anxiety uh, going on and the level of information. And um, Kate have been describing uh, and uh, Andrew, um, all this infodemic. And that was one of the first one also to shut down uh, the information because I was getting really uh, anxious and stressed about the situation and not being able to control. So there's some like addictive behavior as well, part of this visual, vicious spiral. And uh, obviously this inadequate uh, exercise. Um, I guess some of us were a bit worried to get outside, but it's really important to keep your daily exercise and maybe go for a small uh, walk uh, or do some yoga at home and there are plenty of resources on YouTube to keep moving. Um, some also have been um, seen a bit of like financial insecurities due to, to the furlough and uncertainty of knowing if we're going to uh, keep our job after the scheme, uh, but also earning less money because it's uh, most of the time not 100% of your salary. So um, it, it's more it, it's more about all this uh, vicious spiral and uh, and I'll say um, it, it's really about how can you um, uh, try to manage all this uh, element of this uh, spiral. Uh, so, a uh, possible outcome of uh, this uh, uh, of this issue could be um, stress. Obviously, we talk about it, um, and uh, it could be also crossing reference because you could be uh, all could uh, adding uh, more uh, issue. Uh, you don't sleep well. You just don't wake up on time. You don't. Uh, exercise and you feel like all these uh, possible outcomes aggregate 
uh, with each other. So I think it's really important to um, take a step back and uh, take control back into uh, our daily routine. And I think that really uh, what helped me out is to uh, have like a routine uh, together uh, uh, from the morning to, to the evening. And sometimes it could be difficult when you don't have the work schedule and you at home and uh, having, uh, and I'm thinking principally to the parents who have like their kids uh, with them at home. So um, yeah, let's uh, keep in check on that and like having like daily routine and to avoid this possible outcome of, uh, of stress. So uh, we're gonna now uh, go with our pool uh, number two. So I think you're gonna have the question uh, in your screen at the moment. So in your current situation, how many of these outcomes, the one I have described earlier, do you feel you have been experiencing uh, since uh, the beginning of the pandemic? So uh, we talk about stress, addictive behavior, uh, psychological and physical violence, inadequate sleep, inadequate nutrition, inadequate physical uh, exercise, social insecurity and financial insecurity. I mean, it's okay if you haven't experienced on none of them. Some of us are probably experienced uh, a few and uh, I've been <laughs> one of them, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'll let you just uh, finishing to reply to the question and we can then have a look at the result. So let's see. Uh, so for uh, the, so we are about 29% uh, of the poll who have like had an uh, outcome and uh, feeling a bit uh, uh, experiencing some of this uh, outcome. Uh, more than four, 10%, and none, 12% of us never uh, had any uh, uh, outcome. So uh, I guess two outcome, 29% was the main um, takeaway of this, and more than four, 10%. So um, I think I'll be on that range, yeah part of the 10% who get more than four. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next slide, yes. Um, so um, we have to think about how to break through this uh, cycle and, and this chain of causality. And I think uh, we had like few communication of the World Health Organization uh, over uh, the news, but also you can go online and have a look as well. But there are quite few reports to suggest that uh, uh, we, we should probably seek for a more informed decision rather than like uh, going for the day-to-day -day, uh, TV infodemic, but more uh, going for, for example, the World Health Organization website. I'm, I'm quite keen to look at research paper as well if you're more into the academic side but uh, uh, go for like trusted uh, sources. And this is can provide like a, a break uh, on, uh, on this anxiety levels that coming, uh, keeping going up and up as we getting more information about the way um, uh, this pand pandemic is progressing. So um, now it's coming to more to our role as a health and safety professional, what can we really do? And uh, the World Health Organization uh, has been leading on, on this way and working with IOSH a lot. And they come up with like seven uh, important roles that we can have as a health and safety professional. And the first one, as Kate was describing earlier, is to assess uh, the risk. A and uh, uh, by assessing the risk, you can then uh, mitigate. If, if you have any risk, you can mitigate because at this moment, eliminating COVID risk, it's it's nearly impossible for now, but probably in the future. So assessing the risk and uh, providing um, uh, uh, this uh, risk communication and engage with workers, this uh, it's actually key about uh, keeping the communication in order to break this uh, causality effect and building more stress for, uh, for the employee. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the third one that is really related to our uh, webinar today will be collaborating with the uh, community and the public uh, health uh, authorities. So uh, the another extensive um, uh, list of uh, of the rest of the of the most seven important, but I think that the key here will be like really assessing risk, providing risk communication and, and collaboration. Uh, and when you will receive the slide, you will know more about it. So, um, uh, so regarding our role, really it's thinking about um, having a well-being um, strategy. And uh, we had a, a webinar, a few webinars within IOSH where we, we discuss uh, this fundamental and crucial well-being strategy at the um, really the ground level and uh, and as a solid uh, uh, level and then you have like three pillars that are really important to focus on so occupational uh, safety ill health and but also a, a general health promotion principally for the people working at home i think they no better time for uh, our employer to demonstrate uh, that they are here for us and uh, uh, looking after our well-being it's crucial even if you're still at home having working uh, uh, parents uh, at home it's uh, it's something that you have to be really conscious because they have also to look after the child and uh, doing homeschooling as well. And uh, sorry if I ever have to come up to the parenting, but I'm, I'm a mother myself, young mother. So I kind of more um, conscious about the challenges that parents can have. And all of this and, of, uh, uh, and this will improve the well-being in, in general and also improve the organizational uh, culture um, in 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 a system uh, view if if we want so um it come up to look also individually at looking at ourselves and i think something i'm really keen and i've been keen over the years the physical uh, health because sometimes working as a health and safety professional we can think that we immune against uh, mental um uh, mental issues, but uh, we have still have to look after ourselves to being able to look after uh, others within a company and uh, and to give a bit of like uh, anecdote about it. It's like when you're taking a plane with a young child, they have a one year old, uh, one and a half years old baby. You always ask to uh, put your seat belt. You put the baby seat belt because they're sitting with you on the first year. But after when something happened and if the, um, uh, you have some turbulence and you have to put your mask on, you have the parents have to put this mask first and then put it to the child. So sometimes you have to uh, think about uh, yourself first to being able to then look after others. So it could be by uh, having like a platform and being able to listen to your whole mental health and physical well-being and uh, maintaining also work-life balance. It could be quite difficult when your working environment is also where you eat. It could be your kitchen, it could be where you sleep, your room, and it could be where the kids could be going around. Or um, So it's kind of like really trying to compartmentalize um, some um, area of your life and uh, and talking really about how you're feeling because sometimes we kind of keep uh, to ourselves, and I think this is something I stop over the years and um, if you've been following me on LinkedIn I went through a burnout at the end of last year and I had to stop uh, working uh, for a few months uh, so it's something that I understand personally um, the impact of having to uh, not looking after ourselves, or sometimes uh, the consequence of uh, of a mental breakdown. So I'll urge you to to keep a routine and go for daily walk or exercise and and, and do activities that mean doesn't um, that it's something different of a, of a working. So. Um, so we've got few uh, resources uh, in place that can help you uh, 
uh, care about yourself and others. So if you feel like you're losing control or you feel a bit overwhelmed, I mean, the first step will be really to seek for uh, some support. And it could be your family, it could be your friends, it could be your GP. Uh, in my case, I think that the NHS have been doing a fantastic job uh, with me because they've been uh, really um, reactive uh, when, when my, uh, uh, my mental breakdown uh, arrived. So, um, and also it could be, if you don't feel to speak with your family, you have like, um, option to um, yeah, speak with your GP and probably have a therapy or um, having to discuss with someone who is like neutral. Uh, it could be some things that can uh, provide more ease for you to be able to talk. So I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Tim uh, about the further information that we have in Hayosh. That's fantastic, Jesse, and, and thanks, Kate, as well. And, and thanks both as well for sharing some of your own personal insights. I think it's really, really powerful to hear some of your own stories about how um, the, the pandemic has impacted you and I'm sure something that we can all, all learn from. You'll have heard Kate talk earlier about um, the sorts of information that are available for, for us as members and for our, our workforce and clearly relying on social media and others is probably not the best thing to do and there are some really reliable sources of information but um, I think the best thing to do is just to remind everyone that IOSH is probably the best first stop shop for access to information. So what, what we've got on our, our, our IOSH COVID page is, is a collection of information all about um, the virus pulled in from all of the reliable sources of information and includes some really good guidance on about on return to work and so on. So please yeah, um, go to the IOSH website, uh, you'll find it there. Then we've got the two, two large global um, organizations, we've got World Health Organization, and the ILO, which obviously we, we can rely on. Those of you here in the UK, of course, we've got Public Health England, uh, which is also the probably the, the, the best place to go. And that will give us all of the, well, I try to give us all of the information we need to know about the restrictions. But of course, that is such a moving feast that we, we really need to keep, keep abreast of that. And I know some of the questions relate to that, which I'll come on to in a moment. And then if you're uh, elsewhere in the world, you know, please, you know, even in the Americas, we've got the, the, cent, the US Center for Disease Communication, the CDC. If you live in other parts of Europe, the European CDC, which is an excellent place to go as well. So I think the really important thing is let's let's use the most reliable information. That's what we can trust and that will uh, minimise the anxiety. So thank you again, Kate and Jesse. We've got about five minutes now to go through Q&A. As I thought we would, we've got absolutely loads of Q&A, so we, we won't make it all the way through, but I'll try and pick out the ones that I think that are, are most relevant to what we've talked about. And we'll, um, um, I'll perhaps um, start off with um, some answers and, and Kate and Jesse, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, I think just the, the, the first one that just struck me is a very general question for Patrick, who says, how, how do we as OSHA professionals support employers to improve support for employees during COVID-19. And I think that is absolutely fundamental about who we are as OSH professionals. Um, Andrew talked about our visibility and our profile that's never been greater. And I, I certainly back that up as well. And both Kate and Jesse spoke about that as well. So we have the, we have the opportunity to influence. So let's use that opportunity and all of the things that you've heard today on the uh, on the webinar from Kate and Jesse. Let's use those techniques. Let's let's talk to our people and let's talk to our our bosses about the things that we know will be support will be effective in supporting our people. You know, from the very practical measures that you've heard of to the more you know general ones and certainly things you know things like employer. Um, assistance providers and occupational health services that, that, that we may or may not have available. So, um, Jesse, Kate, do you have other, other experiences of the support mechanisms that are available? 
I think one of the things that I, I found um, where I am in, in BSI is, you know, we're, we're a global organization. So trying to everybody's in a slightly different place because different countries are um, seeing a different phase in terms of, of COVID and therefore kind of the support needs are, are different. So I think, you know, helping your business understand that not everybody will necessarily be in the same place. And I think the, the other thing that I've kind of been um, talking a lot about in in BSI is and 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 to our clients is that you know particularly when we think about um, mental health and psychological health is not not everybody is impacted at the same time you know and not everybody will bounce back in the same time you know one of the things that we we know from studies is that quite often kind of it's it's three months of ex, you know when we're it's when we're exposed to um, excess pressure for three months that can often be a trigger point and three months is quite a long time that's what we've been facing and certainly i've seen that um within bsi and our clients they're seeing kind of a, a peak you know it will there'll be you know that wave that I talked about, it will peak and trough. And I think, you know, making sure our organisations understand that, you know, it's not just now, it's it's medium and longer term. And I think related to that, you know, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about is there's very good evidence from previous um, epidemics and pandemics that people are likely to suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that's something that can actually um, show itself um, months or even years after the event so again from my point of view educating organizations that you know they've been doing some really really amazing work right now to help and support people they're going to need to be doing that for the long term yes and i think uh, i'm going to reinforce what uh, kate is saying it's more now looking at the long-term strategy and not thinking that this is a one-off we have to be prepared for the future as well and get uh, uh, ready for potentially a new way of looking after people now for, um, for the uh, organization. We're coming out to, the, to a new way of doing things. And I think most of the people might never return to the office. And I've seen some um, organization moving out from their office in central London at this time because they have decided that they're not coming back. So it, it might be a, a new normal of having um, probably half of your staff working from home. So it's gonna be convenient to think about what can we do now as an organization to help our uh, employee to be as efficient from home and uh, how can we help them to keep their mental health on track as well. Yeah, and be there because you lose a bit this um, um, social element as well, which is could be really difficult for some people. Yeah, and I've seen that. Yeah. Th thanks, Jesse. Almost out of time, but I think I can probably squeeze one more in, which is an actually a fascinating question from Mark, who says, can you really quantify levels of anxiety and stress? Well, I think the answer is yes, to the extent there's a whole industry and uh, profession who, um, who will uh, base their, their work on quantifying levels of anxiety and stress. Of course, we're talking about the uh, psychologists and, and, and so on. But I think if we bring it back to us as OSH professionals, and let's just take it back to the, the, uh, the matrix that Kate shared, you know, the one we're all familiar with around how the severity of risk and, and recognising, I think we do recognise all of us now that, um, that the anxiety and stress is a workplace hazard and no much more so than now so you know we don't need to get our calculators out to, to quantify it but we can certainly classify it in a way that brings it out to to the key decision makers who can help our people um, to actually have um, have benefit and put controls in place to manage it I think that's probably you know the, the best thing the best way of answering that we could we could have a whole a whole webinar on, on just that in itself but um, but th thanks for the thanks for the question mark a great one all right, well, well, all it leaves me to do again is once again thank uh, Kate and Jesse for a fantastic presentation. Uh, really, really interesting, some really great insights and personal insights. Thank you all as well for attending. So we had nearly 300 people on, so that, that's really great to have you all on. Uh, remember, you've got all the access to the information here. And if you, quickly before we close the, the, in the chat, there's those links. So click on those before they disappear. And, and all, I can, all, I, all that's left to me is thank you once again for attending. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are. And um, hopefully you can join another one of our IOSH webinars really soon. So thank you and goodbye.